Hello and welcome. I'm Valerie Paley, Senior Vice President and Sue Ann Weinberg Director of the Patricia D. Klingenstein Library at the New York Historical Society. Before we begin, I would like to thank Louise Mirror, our President and CEO, Agnes Su Tang, Chair of the Board of Trustees, and Pam Schaffler, our Chair Emerita, as well as all of our trustees, Joyce B. Cowan, Diane Max, and the late Adam Max, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation along with our Chairman's Council, our members, and our many other generous donors, none of the work at New York Historical would be possible without your continued and committed support. I am honored to be recognized as the founding director of our Center for Women's History, the first such center of its kind within the walls of a major museum in the United States. In only a few short years, we've been able to accomplish so much in terms of scholarship, education, programs, collecting, and not least of all, exhibitions all of which foreground women's critical role in American history. Tonight's program, Crafting Black Dolls, The Women Behind the Needle, is presented in conjunction with Black Dolls, the show currently on view in New York Historical's Robert H. and Clarice Smith Gallery. The program will last approximately 45 minutes, including 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end, which you can submit via the Q&A function on your Zoom screen at any point during the presentation. The chat function has been disabled, so please do make sure to use the Q&A. After the presentation, we'll get it to as many questions as time allows. And now, I am delighted to introduce today's speakers. Faith Davis Ruffins has been a historian and curator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History since 1981. She has curated or consulted on several major African-American exhibitions and on many community history projects around the country. Her early publications were among the first to explore the history of African-American preservation efforts. In 2018, her most recent publication, Building Homes for Black History, Museum Founders, Founding Directors, and Pioneers, 1915 to 1995, won the G. Wesley Johnson Award from the National Council on Public History for the best article in the journal Public Historian. Angela Tate is curator of women's history at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Her work touches on the intersection of gender, race, and sexuality, and also encompasses Black women's activism and feminist responses to historical and contemporary issues. Her work has been published in multiple venues, such as Resonance, the Journal of Sound and Culture, and Culture Study, the newsletter from Anne Helen Peterson. Our moderator, Michelle Mitchell, is Associate Professor of History at New York University and a member of our own Center for Women's History Scholarly Advisory Board. She is the former North American editor of Gender and History, and her scholarly work has appeared in Keywords in African American Studies, Journal of Women's History, Cuban Studies, Public Historian, and the Journal of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, among others. In addition to her work, Righteous Propagation, African Americans and the Politics of Racial Destiny After Reconstruction, Mitchell has co-edited Dialogues of Dispersal, Gender, Sexuality, and African Diasporas, Gender, Imperialism, and Global Exchanges, and Heterosexual Histories. She is currently writing Idle Anxieties, Youth, Race, and Sexuality During the Great Depression. We are honored to, on, uh, to welcome Fat Faith, Angela, and Michelle. Thank you so much, Valerie, for that very generous introduction. And I really would like to begin in part by thanking Margie Hofer, as well as Dominique Jean-Louis, the co-curators of this wonderful exhibition. And I'm going to start off by reading a couple of reflections, one by Margot Jefferson and another by Deborah Willis. They're very short. So Margot Jefferson has written the following observation on dolls. Dolls are the only toys made in our image, the only human-like creatures children are given dominion over. You do what you want with the doll. You're loving, you're fickle, you're imperious and stern. You coo and comfort the doll. You hurl it down and spank it. You speak to it. You speak as it. You speak for it. Along these lines, the child's play section of the exhibition features striking images of children with their dolls. Significantly, Deborah Willis has argued that reading these unique photographs informs how racial identity was posed and performed. So Angela and Faith, the first question I'd like to ask is for you, how do Jefferson's and Willis's insights help us understand the powerfully racialized and gendered significance of doll play? 
Uh, well, I might start by saying um, dolls, although mini dolls are made for children, there are many adults who love, collect, and make dolls. So it's, it is important to understand about a doll, whether it was really made for a child to play with it, or whether it's, it's a part of an adult um, uh, discourse which might be true about abolition, or it might be true today about people who just love to collect dolls or who are particularly interested in collecting black dolls. So there are various kinds of adult discourses that dolls play in. But if we focus specifically on children, um, I think that dolls, I think that Margot Jefferson's comments are very to the point in the sense that uh, although children can do all of those things with any of their toys, um, the dolls are the only things that look like people or look like some people. Uh, and it's useful to note that historically of the dolls that were made for children to play with, there tended to either just be baby dolls, dolls that were meant to be um, small children or babies, or dolls that look like adults. One of the differences today is that we have a lot of dolls that look like children or teenagers or tweens, they're, they're dolls all along the um, development spectrum of childhood. But in most of the period that these dolls come from, there were either sort of adult looking dolls or there were child dolls, dolls that, that were meant to be um, played with by children and um, were baby dolls. So uh, it, it's interesting to think about uh, that dolls appear at sort of the beginning of childhood, one might say historically and at the end of childhood when they're when they're adults <clears throat> and I think that makes them particularly emotionally significant to children because children especially smaller children you know many things are bigger than them but generally speaking their dolls are smaller than they are uh, although in the pictures uh, in the um, New York historical exhibition it shows some children who have rather large dolls uh, you know 18 inch, 24 inch dolls. Uh, but the majority of the dolls that, that um, are in the exhibition that you see many children play with are, are smaller. And I think this gives the child, uh, uh, Jefferson uses the word dominion. Um, I think it gives the child uh, an agency and a, and a power over the doll that, that, is, that they don't have over many things in their lives because they're small and, and they're children. And I think this plays uh, very powerfully into some of the racially significant dolls because it means that uh, on the one hand, a small white child or a small non-black child has dominion over this black doll, which may in fact uh, look like an adult, maybe an adult type doll. And um, for uh, black children or African-American children, they may be uh, experiencing a, um, uh, uh, a reinforcement or a sense of a family because perhaps there are babies in their family or there are other babies they know or it looks it may not look exactly like them and that's one of the issues that I like to talk about colorism in dolls <laughs> but um, but it looks a lot more like them than uh, maybe mainstream predominantly white dolls on the on the market so I think Jefferson has kind of put her her finger on something very important, which is that dolls highlight the agency of children at the same time as they reflect the priorities of adults. Mm -hmm. Because the adults are making or buying the dolls and giving them to the children. So it's a very complex, toys are complex in any way, but dolls are particularly complex toys. I completely agree. I mean, I was thinking of that complexity and that these dolls, like you were saying, they, that they can look like baby dolls or they can look like adults. And while the children do have agency over these dolls, as Jefferson says in her wonderful quote, um, they were also given to the children by the adults. They were created by adults. And then they were created and given to children for particular modes of behavior and particular modes of being. Um, and you can think about the, the gendered ways in which children play with adults. They are typically given to young girls mm -hmm. to be taught how to be 
mothers Correct. and also to be taught to be taught how to share and to give and to yes. always care for others in ways that young boys are not socialized to behave towards other people or other mm -hmm. objects and so when you're thinking about like what what are girls People who, people who are gendered as girl and people who are gendered as boys, as youth, and how they are interacting with dolls. And then when you think about historically, if you had a black doll and you were a white child, you tended to have a black doll to replicate this life that was happening, particularly in the antebellum period around young black children being given to young white owners and being willed to other people as property. And so that gendered and racialized dynamic, and then also the age dynamic with just the existence of the dolls, how they are interacted with, all serve to tell this larger story and a very complex story in the exhibition where it leaves you thinking, well, what is the significance of this doll? What is this doll doing, not only at, in its manufactured stage, but also in its play stage? Well, I think that Angela, just your your point about the replication of life in terms of slavery um, is really powerful when you think about the sale of children, um, when you think about the service of, of black women, of black men, and the use of dolls to represent um, black people as servants. And so I think that that's incredibly powerful to keep in mind, especially when we consider that a number of the dolls in the exhibition um, are thought to have been crafted by either enslaved women or formerly enslaved women. Um, and what I'd like to do is return to a point that, that Faith mentioned um, is that it's critical to understand that not all dolls were made with child's play in mind. And along these lines, I wanna go to three dolls featured at the outset of the exhibition. So they were crafted by abolitionists. Cynthia Walker Hill, a white woman abolitionist from Providence, Rhode Island, crafted a doll representing an enslaved man wearing a punishment collar, an iron punishment collar. There's another finely dressed doll wearing a gentleman's top coat. And that doll was made by a member of the Badger family of Milton, Massachusetts and was sold by abolitionists to support Union soldiers. And finally, there's still another doll made by Hill that represents the once enslaved black abolitionist Frederick Douglass. And abolitionists argued that may the points of our needles prick the slaveholders conscious, conscience. And so with these particular dolls, the question I'd like to ask is that we've got these examples of dolls material culture produced for a political purpose. And what I'm wondering is if you can reflect a little bit on the lasting political, on the lasting political significance of not only these dolls produced by abolitionists, but also the dolls produced by another abolitionist in the, in the exhibition, um, Harriet Jacobs, because there are also three dolls that, that she produced for the children of the Willis family. And so I would just like for you to reflect a little bit on the political significance that then and or now, the lasting political significance? Well, one thing I would say is that many, um, you know, we can, we, we can argue that the history of abolition may not be well taught in uh, uh, secondary, certainly not in primary, in secondary schools. And I don't think most people have ever thought about how did the abolitionists raise money? I don't think most people have ever right. it's ever occurred to them, but there were a number of things. They had uh, samplers. They made, I mean, particularly women, uh, made samplers. They made quilts. They made um, dolls. They made a variety of products. They used free cotton. Cotton that wasn't produced by slave labor and made clothes specifically out of them. And all of these things were to raise money for the abolitionist cause. Now, there are other things people did. For example, Frederick Douglass was just the most famous person who went around and gave speeches. And, you know, in the 19, in the antebellum period, there's no television, there's no radio. So people would go to, for, to all day, you know, take lunches and go all day and listen to people give speeches. And people, and Douglass himself, gave many multi-hour, two and three hour speeches. This is another way that they raised money. But the point is that um, every political cause has to be funded in some way. And the cause of abolition, they had, they had music that special, music that they played, they would give concerts. Um, it's a, you see the grassroots elements of the abolition movement 
in this material culture and in the, the this um, expressive culture, songs, stories, um, that uh, speeches, sermons that people gave to to raise money and to raise consciousness, but also to raise money. And I think that it, it points to um, the fact that uh, dolls play a significant role in adult culture as well. They're not only for children, although today we primarily think of dolls uh, as being made for children, but that was not true then and, and actually isn't really still true today. Although it is probably not the primary way that people uh, raise money for political causes today. I'd also just say that there is a very, a highly political um, uh, content to African Americans making their own dolls. And the, the end of the exhibition uh, shows a little bit of that history, which is very significant as well. I was really going to, again, riff off of what you were saying, Faith, about fundraising and abolitionists, um, and particularly thinking about why why they needed to make dolls um just the the doll with the torture device on it just made me think of Sadia Hartman's uh scenes of subjection where she talks about how you know people were unable to truly sympathize and empathize and think yes. about the suffering of slavery unless <clears throat> they could visualize it they could see it they didn't really feel it if it was told to them, they needed to see it. And so just thinking about this doll needing to replicate this particularly humiliating and painful moment in an enslaved man's life in order to raise funds to talk about the ills of slavery and the evils of chattel slavery is so, it just makes me think like, did you need to replicate that pain? Did you <clears throat> need to replicate that humiliation? And, and thinking about the contrast of Harriet Jacobs then making dolls herself. Um, and also the fact that maybe those dolls represented the childhood that she did not experience with her own children when she was hiding in her grandmother's attic. And then she gave them to young white children who would never have known this is where she came from. This is what she experienced before she came into their household. And so these two different purposes for these dolls, um, a black created doll for a white audience and a white created doll for a white audience and how that creates different meanings through these dolls. And just like, why do we need to see the outward pain? And then Harriet Jacobs dolls seem benign on the outside, but you probably can tell by looking at them that there was some personal pain in the making of them that she did not expose to the public, even though she did expose so much of her life when she wrote her um, narrative of her experiences as an enslaved woman. And the Jacobs dolls are really exquisite. They're, they're, they're so- yeah, they're very beautiful. They're really beautiful. And, you know, this is, this, this we've, we touched upon it, but I wanna sort of ask it very um, explicitly. Um, that we could think about these dolls as being examples of folk art. Mm. But I really want to sort of probe why it's important to think about these dolls as providing insights into black women's caregiving labor. Um, that's, a, that's a very, very interesting question. I, I will say um, folk art, you know, was a term that was, that was widely used, not, so, not used so much anymore uh, in the art world. And, um, as a historian, I always thought that folk art was, was a bad phrase. In the US especially, because who are the folk? Yes. What folk meant in Germany or Norway, uh, Finland is really not the same as what we're talking about. Are enslaved people the folk? Who are the folk? Um, but I think perceiving these dolls solely as the expression of, a, solely as an artistic expression does not, um, address the highly, highly gendered and um, highly racialized aspect of having these dolls in a predominantly white context. Uh, and for that reason, although many of these dolls, many of the dolls in this collection and many of the dolls one might see uh, don't come with a specific provenance, mm -hmm. it's actually very, very important to know 
what that provenance is because if these dolls were made by a um, black woman for her enslaver's children or perhaps after slavery, as with uh, Harriet Jacobs, she was making them for essentially her employer's uh, children and she was employed essentially in domestic work, the kind of work that many um, enslaved women who worked in homes did during slavery. And of course was, uh, as historians know, the primary um, category of labor outside the home that black women did for many decades. It was very difficult to get jobs outside of domestic work for black women. And with all the perils uh, that that entailed, I think too, it's important to understand that many, especially in the 19th century or in the 1800s, since we're speaking to a wider audience, that people did not have the kind of psychological interpretation of things that we have today. So many people interpret the world in a far more religious context. And so mm -hmm. the, the, um, the notions that we have, for example, that people can unconsciously enact things that they themselves are not conscious of doing is not really the way people in the 1800s thought about how life worked. And so uh, in some ways, people did think, people uh, uh, produce things that uh, they may have felt far more straightforwardly about than we do, because we see that they may show uh, uh, what we would interpret as a more torturous uh, kind of psychology. Because um, you know, some uh, women who did domestic work lived in the household, right. and they didn't live outside the white household, or they didn't. Li they might have lived in a separate uh, little house or something, but they didn't live outside of uh, the white context and control. Some domestic women, of eventually the larger number, lived with their own children. Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of questions that Providence, when you can get it. Um, answers. Did, did uh, uh, some of these women make some similar dolls for their own children? Yes. Um, did they only make them for white children? Uh, I mean, I'm, now I'm talking about specific, um, specific dolls and their specific context. And it's very hard to get that. I will say uh, that the African American Museum uh, several years ago collected uh, a doll and um, uh, some photographs and much more was known about the woman who made these dolls. And she was a, a black woman, formerly enslaved, but who lived with a white family after the end of uh, uh, slavery and made these dolls for the white children who worked with her, who she worked uh, for and with. And so what are the levels of psychological, um, you know, so, especially after immediately after the end of slavery, uh, these women might have had children and not be able to find them or be able to contact them because they were sold away from them. Uh, the, the, the emotional complexity of what those women are doing um, in giving these dolls to white children, I think is, is, um, is very, very, it's very profound and it's very complex. And sometimes we don't have enough information about the origin of a particular doll to fully understand but it seems to me that at least some of those people had to have some of these highly complex emotions in relation to their own children, the white children that they are caring for, and may indeed love, particularly as children, um, and these dolls. It's a, it's a very, very uh, complex um, intersection of motives and um, uh, emotions and we are we we because we don't have a lot of provenance for some of these dolls. We have to kind of interpret them in a generalized way, and that's general generalizably part of the story. It has to be part of the story because we know from other sources that <clears throat> the complexities of emotion are part of these women's lives. That really dovetails with the question of folk art. Um, because throughout art and art history in particular, the study of art, being an artist has been assigned to someone who has humanity, who has complex feelings and emotions and thoughts. And so to think that 
dolls, particularly those that are created by African Americans, are folk art. They're as in it's not serious, it's not complex, it's not intellectual, it's not pushing an artistic movement forward, just goes back to continuing to see African Americans as lacking humanity, as lacking the kind of rationality and reasoning and consciousness and, and soul that non-Black people would have to create art. Um, which is really funny because, you know, one of the things that I enjoy about working at my institution is how it shows how just the material culture and the crafts and the handicrafts and the creations of enslaved people created so many of the structures and the architecture and the design and the lifestyles that we think are just mainstream American. And so just this, this exhibition, I feel like it's turning that assumption on its head and that this is not folk. What is folk art? Like you said, who, who are the folk? Is it African-Americans or is it white people who are the folk? And African-Americans are the ones that are the creating the fine art and the material culture and that, that deep intellectual, spiritually based, soul-based, emotion-based art and creativity that you know, you're looking at when you're looking at this exhibition and you're looking at these dolls that are supposedly replicas of people that society has said did not have any humanity and still struggles to see as fully recognized and realized humans. Well, you know, I think um, before I go on to the next question, I just want to say that I think that you both have made incredibly powerful points, um, especially about, you know, well, not especially, but one of them being the way that we think about artists as being somebody who is assigned, who is assigned humanity um, and black people have often not been assigned that, but also going back to Faith's point about um, along the lines of caregiving labor, black women who might've lost children. This goes back to something that you also said, Angela. And when you think about those dolls again, that Harriet Jacobs produced for the children of um, writer um, Nathan Willis, you think about it as, you know, political work in its way, but also caregiving work. Mm -hmm. And so just the complexity of the labor of somebody like Harriet Jacobs making those dolls. And so-, so just, I just wanna to add to that, that, that they also represent the needle trades. In other words, women's production yes. of artistic, uh, women's artistic productions have often been seen as lesser than in part because they are using, um, they are making quilts and dolls and other things that you can sew because many, many women, you know, were taught to sew as girls. Um, some people sew better than others. Some people, uh, you know, can hand stitch equal uh, uh, little stitches. Other people are, cannot do that. And so you do see a variety in the dolls. You see dolls that are more crudely made and dolls that are very elaborate. Dolls that are that have layers of clothing. One of the little exhibits in the uh, in the in the show in the exhibition demonstrates that you can't actually see all of the doll um, just by looking at it on the surface because the doll actually is wearing the undergarments that would have gone with that dress um, if a real person was wearing them. So dolls, these dolls range from very crude dolls to very elaborate dolls. And that tells us something about the skill uh, of, of the people who made them. But just in general, many of women's uh, productions are called crafts or handicrafts. They're not art like paintings like men make. And so this is part of a larger devaluing of women's artistic production. It's a subset of that, but it's a particularly important one. Well, I'm really glad that you made these 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 follow-up points, Faith, because it touches upon um, things I was thinking about women's fabric arts, but Black women's fabric arts in particular. Um, and somebody like a Jacobs, who I believe did work as a seamstress as well. Oh, yeah. She yes. was well, a well-known seamstress. Yes. And many of these women, you know, probably made clothes for their the children that they worked for. Uh, some seamstresses made made clothes for the white women, some very elaborate ball gowns and that sort of thing, um, and other forms of fabric art. 
So these dolls should be seen also within that context of the production of, for black women, uh, that go all the way from very simple uh, baby dolls to very, very elaborate uh, needle, needle trades and needle outputs of sewing and fabrics, fabric art, as you would call it. Um, Angela, would you like to follow up on that? Oh, I mean, women were also not seen as fully human. Um, and so the intersection of race and gender, uh, we can nod to intersectionality uh, with that. Uh, then of course, black women's handicrafts are going to be doubly devalued, um, particularly since, you know, when they were enslaved and then after, you know, the period of slavery, when, the, you know, as Faith already said, most black women were domestics. You were just a part of the machine of the household. You were not a fully recognized human who was contributing something other than your labor. And therefore, you know, she's, you're sewing a, a, a dress or you're making a doll or you're mending drapery and curtains. It's, it's, that's what you're there to do. That's your sole right. function. You are not here to show that you are expressing creativity. Absolutely, absolutely. Although you are, yeah. as we know, although you are. That's why we treasure these things now yes. well, when we can find them because they once were very common and now are very rare. Well, I want to ask you, I want to, this is a slight shift. Um, I'm going to be asking you a question about the design of the exhibition, one aspect of it shortly, but I'm gonna ask another question first. And um, <coughs> on the one hand, there are some cloth dolls in the exhibition that people might think um, represent stereotype or caricature, but instead it's more of a reflection, as you mentioned, Faith, of the skill level of the, the maker of the doll. Um, but there are other dolls that are you know, that are really purposefully representing black women as servants. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, there's also in the exhibition, um, an image of a patent for a home sewn mammy doll. And so mm -hmm. this is quite literally, um, mm -hmm. you know, representing black women as, as, as servants. And so I'm wondering if you just have comments about that deconstructing Dinah section of the exhibition, or if you would rather just comment on the complexities and issues of, of mammy dolls or dolls that are really solely really meant to represent black women as servants? Um, one thing I would say is that at, and there's a little part of the exhibition where you see other kinds of toys and um, children's yeah. books and stuff mm -hmm. that, that represent the kind of stereotypical uh, productions of, uh, of uh, books and other, other kinds of toys. I will say that there are a lot of black of toys made. Some of them are manufactured and some are handmade, but a lot of them are manufactured that represent black men and women as servants. And some of these, especially with the men, some of these are, are kind of violent, not kind of, some of them are very violent, like um, um, a doll where uh, you cut off the head and you can put money in the bank, or yes. you can, um, or a doll, or a game, a toy, where you can push down on something on one side and off flips uh, the a, a person on the other end, who is a black person, often is a black man or boy. So there, these dolls are only one type. There are many people I think are very unaware of the the panoply of stereotypical toys that were primarily meant for children to be played with, which demonstrate the, not only the, the lack of humanity, but the, the, um, the, uh, the ability to be violent at will towards black people, uh, not simply as servants, because servants can be portrayed uh, in a nostalgic way that at least many of the white people surround in, experiencing it thought was sentimental. And you see this in greeting cards uh, tremendously. There are a lot, many people are unaware of the fact that there were black stereotypical greeting cards made of stereotypical images of black, generally older men and women or little children pickaninnies that run through the history of American greeting cards from the very beginning up until the fifties. 
you know, today we don't send, most people don't send Thanksgiving cards, for example. Um, but there are thousands of Thanksgiving cards, Valentine's Day cards that show stereotypical images of black men and women. And so these dolls, um, uh, to some degree, are especially the, the better made ones, are among the better and less stereotypical forms than some of these other violent, um, um, you know, uh, stories of the little black child being chased by the alligator. I mean, these are just rife in uh, American popular culture and are reinforced not only in the minstrel shows, uh, the classic minstrel shows of the 1800s, but in vaudeville and in a lot of forms of American popular culture well into the 20th century, um, well into the 50s and early 60s. So the dolls, there is an entire array of toys, games, books, songs, um, all kinds of things that, that, that show stereotypical images of Black people for children, young children, or, you know, somewhat older children, eight to 10 year old children to play with. I was just thinking about how embedded just Blackface <laughs> minstrelsy was in American pop culture for decades after the Civil War and yes. how, you know, like I, I watched a lot of old movies at one point in my life um, from, you know, made during the golden age of Hollywood, the 1920s, to the 1960s, and just being like a normal movie and then blackface shows up, right. you know, and it's kind of like, what was that? Or, you know, black actors, when they would have speaking roles, they would be these stereotypical butlers or maids or mammies, even, you know, Gone with the Wind isn't just one movie. There were several movies that Patty McDaniel or uh, other black There's actors. There's a battle, there any number of yeah, these films. Several. Um, and so just thinking about these mammy dolls and just, I mean, not even just about nostalgia, but kind of just seeing one way of representing black women and how that, you know, that, that stereotypical mammy caretaker, sexless, you know, a lot of the time seemingly unattractive. And this also happened at the time of, you know, an increasing amount of people being lynched and the excuses made for why black men as well as black women were being lynched. And so just the way that this mammy figure and also like just the general black faced minstrel pop culture that dominated American society for so long was both a time to diminish and oppress black people, but also to continue to control their image and how other people would see them. I mean, as you know, a lot of historians talk about this early 20th century as a period of modernity. And that period of modernity was, you know, going back to artists, like they were looking at, you know, primitive cultures to create modern art and also still, you know, portraying these stereotypical images of African-Americans. And so like this, this concept of modernity, excluding African-Americans and keeping them crystallized in these slavery era stereotypes was just a, 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 an attempt to continue to say that African-Americans lacked the humanity to move into modernity. They were not a part of just creating modern society. Well, I also would say about specifically mammy dolls um, that I think it's hard for African-Americans to understand that uh, many white people felt that this was very benign that this was really um, a, a, a testament uh, to the loyalty and um, uh, warmth. I sometimes call it the, the, the uncritical mother. The mammy represents sort of the mother that maybe a small child experiences of the all giving, all forgiving, you know, cook for me, boundless love, anything that you do is perfect this kind of image of the mother it is an image not the only image but it's a it's an image that many white people found very reassuring this is why the daughters of the confederacy want to erect yes. a statue to to uh, celebrate mammy 
on the uh, on the mall. That actually doesn't happen. But there are other statues in other places and in um, world in expositions and fairs of this image of the mammy. So it's it's I think sometimes difficult for African Americans to to see the the side that said this this isn't a bad thing. This is a, this is a testament. That's what <clears throat> Hattie McDaniel's represents uh, in Gone with the Wind. She's she keeps the family together. She's the she's the solid rock around whom the family um, operates. Well, of course, that's all well and nice, but you know, black people need civil rights, and they need uh, you. Know, they need to be in another role. They need to have choice. They need to have the kind of freedoms other Americans have. But I think it's important to understand why the mammy, in particular, image lasts so long. Why Aunt Jemima lasts to the very present day. Now, apparently, the company has finally decided in 2020 to drop it. But this is 140 years, 1893, it's introduced, and it's, it's a little bit earlier than that. And when I used to, I mean, I'm older than some of the other people on this panel, and I used to uh, give talks, because uh, when I was head of advertising history, I did a lot of work on race and ethnicity. And when I would talk about the image of Mammy and Aunt Jemima and how this came to be, <clears throat> elderly white people would come up to me after the talk and say, you know, Aunt Jemima, came to my town in Wisconsin and made pancakes at the, you know, local uh, supermarket or store. And she was just so wonderful and loving and warm. And it's that sentiment, that nostalgia for kind of a, a almost like Edenic world in which, in which there's no racial conflict, in which there is no striving uh, for, for betterment. This this was very reassuring and very warm, uh, and a lot of a lot of especially women, a lot of uh, women really experienced this, and it's a, uh, I think that is part of why it has such lasting power. Excellent, excellent. Um, this is going to be the last question that I'm going to offer before opening the, the floor up, and so I want to jump ahead to another point in the exhibition um, at the end: Black Dolls, Black Pride. And so it features versions of the dolls used in Mamie and Kenneth uh, Clark's doll test, the experiment which mm -hmm. formed the Supreme Court's uh, 1954 decision in Brown v. Ward. Um, but less well known in that part of the exhibition are advertisements for black dolls produced by black companies. That's right. And so um, we've already discussed the racial politics of doll play, but I'm wondering whether you would like to comment um, on explicitly on black adults' realization of the meaningfulness of doll play. Well, um, I think most people don't realize that the idea that black people wanted to make their own dolls for their own children goes back very far. By the early 20th century, um, people form manufacturing companies to do it. it. It moves beyond just a woman in her own home making a doll for her children out into being able to manufacture and sell and distribute. The crisis, for example, uh, had many advertisements for black dolls and also for games that were produced by black companies. Um, now, we don't know, or if you know, Angela, I'd love to hear um, exactly the distribution and the, the presence of these dolls in the early 20th century is hard to track. Like how many were produced? Were they were they regional? Did, you know, were they mostly in... Um, the uh, Atlantic states, or were they also in California? You know, we don't know very much about the spread of these dolls, but we see evidence that a lot of people wanted to have them <clears throat> and wanted to buy them. And of course, by the time you get to the 1950s, you have um, bigger, somewhat bigger companies. Many of these companies don't last very long. They last two or three or four years, but there are movements uh, throughout the 20th century of black people to create their own dolls. And of course, today, today we, you know, there's black doll maker conferences and there, um, you know, the, it's, uh, you know, there are clubs and um, there are all kinds of dolls. Just before this, I was looking on Etsy and seeing what was available and you can find 
of black made dolls from sort of like twelve ninety nine to you know two hundred and fifty dollars. Um, uh, really art, really artistic dolls uh, made by people who are consciously thinking of themselves as artists mm -hmm. <clears throat> and producing them. And many of those dolls are actually not for children either because there are a lot of people, adult women who collect dolls. In this range, all dolls are not for children, but these dolls represent uh, pride and self-consciousness and uh, political and uh, uh, monetary power for right. Black people um, uh, in, in taking control of their own image, particularly for their children, but also uh, for their community. Yeah, then in a way, this kind of goes back to your earlier question, Michelle, about the political significance. Like, so, yes. you know, in general, like a lot of these doll companies you know, lack the funding, lack the distribution. Um, but then there's also the fact that, you know, these companies were devalued, undervalued, and mm -hmm. there was no museum and no archive <laughs> that would take their papers, that would take, you know, if anyone had a doll and they're like, oh, I bought a doll in 1927 from this black company, I'm going to donate it to a museum. There was none of that. So this has been lost in time because of institutions not valuing these productions and these businesses. And so this, but yet the persistence of African-Americans across the 20th century into the 21st century as Faith has discovered on Etsy just shows that, think about dolls as a source of self-determination, not just right. a toy, right. not just a, an ornament, mm -hmm. but a sign of, of continued self-determination uh, amongst African-Americans to control and distribute their own image in their own way. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. If anyone listening or watching knows of dolls that were produced earlier in the 20th century by any of these black companies, you should really get in touch with some museum somewhere because they are, these are scarce as hen's teeth. I myself have never actually seen one that I knew to be produced by one of these early 20th century companies. I've seen ones from the 50s. Uh, and around World War II, but not from these early companies. And I just wonder if they've all been lost or are they, are they in someone's trunk and we haven't found them yet? I hope they're in someone's trunk and we haven't found them yet. Uh, but I think we would know a lot more. It just shows the level at which these political organizations, the NAACP is a political organization, but it is, they understand that politics starts with children. And uh, the crisis actually had a little children's publication that it produced for a number of years. So um, they are, they're very concerned uh, that Black children are able to experience, have prideful experiences as children. So we've got a really interesting question. And this is, I'm glad that somebody's asking this because this is something I wanted to ask as well. And the question is, what do you think about the mystery of the topsy-turvy doll with so much <laughs> unknown? How can we understand them? And what do they tell us about the past? There's so much to say about topsy-turvy dolls. <laughs> um, and there, in most of them that I've seen, there's very little provenance on them. Uh, but these are dolls that, first of all, I've never seen any men done this way. There are male dolls, and there are male dolls in the New York Historical Society exhibit. But the topsy-turvy dolls are always women. And generally, they are a... A relatively well dressed white woman on one end and a, a servant looking like with a head tie and a certain kinds of calico clothing and that sort of thing on the other end. And the skirts are sort of reversible. So you can have one doll's head out and the other doll's head is closed. How did children play with these dolls? Um, what did they do and say with them? Um, were they simply replicating the social relations they saw their parents doing? Did they uh, uh, change the script in some way? We know these dolls were extremely popular uh, in the late 19th, early, late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, but the topsy-turvy doll, it seems to me, is almost the pinnacle of, um, uh, I mean, of demonstrating 
the kind of uh, racial political work that that these dolls are doing because they are um, apparently it's hard to know without real provenance, but they seem to be uh, replicating and representing the uh, the the correct or the approved or the socially acceptable mode of relationships between uh, black women and uh, white women. Black women, white you know, black women are servants. Black women are, if not owners, are uh, employers and um, uh, powerful. Uh, on the other hand, they're linked together. I mean, this is what I mean by um, uh, people in, in, in many of these years didn't think about things in the psychological way that they do. We do. These dolls are linked. I mean, literally, you could say they're joined at the hip. They, you know, they, 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 are, they are the same doll. They are part of the same piece of material culture, yet they represent opposites, um, one could say. You know, they represent um, um, social relations. Um, and it's interesting, very interesting to think about, I mean, did any black children have topsy-turvy dolls? These are some of the kinds of questions we don't entirely know. Um, I think that I have seen pictures of black children with topsy-turvy dolls, but I'm not absolutely certain about that. I mean, I, I couldn't, I um, couldn't, because of, <laughs> Because of COVID, most of my catalogs of books are in my office, not at my house. So um, I wasn't necessarily able to go down and check in all the catalogs that I have. But pretty much, we think that these dolls were primarily um, owned and used by white children, white families. But we don't really know that for a fact. I want to go back to Faith's your 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 brief comment about colorism, because when I looked at the dolls, it made me think about passing narratives. Um, ah. Flipping one side as a black doll, flipping the other side as a white doll, and how like a lot of the anxiety around passing was that you could not identify who was black and who was white. And so maybe those dolls being linked together and flipping upside down was a way to kind of say, this is what a black person looks like. And this is what a white person looks like or a white woman and a black woman. And they will never look alike. Mm -hmm. Well, just very quickly. And then I want to point out something that Valerie Paley has underscored um, that um, I find it fascinating that these dolls were very, very popular as Jim Crow was becoming entrenched mm -hmm. the height of racial segregation. So I find that really interesting. And um, apparently um, Valerie points out that a white woman patented um, the materials used in uh, at least one topsy-turvy doll in 1920. Mm -hmm. So that's very interesting, again, in terms of thinking about who's making them. We've got a number of questions and I'm gonna see which one I can get to. Um, one question is whether or not all toys in general are considered folk art. Oh. <laughs> um. In, in the era in which folk art was a bigger term, um, all toys are not considered folk art, no. The, the folk art as a term tended to focus on things that were handmade, not things that were mass manufactured. So the further you go into the 20th century, it, it was true in the 1700s and 1800s, there were manufactured toys and dolls then too. But as you go into the consumerist 20th and 21st century, now the majority of toys that children play with are mass manufactured. Whereas in the late 1800s, children would have played with a mix of toys and games, some of which might have been manufactured, but some of which were hoops and um, balls that people made out of, uh, you know, they were leather makers and they could make balls all toys were not mass manufactured then, but folk art as a term tends to refer to things that are handmade um, and are not mass manufactured. And that's that's why all toys are not folk would not have been considered folk art. Um, I would there's another question that gets to the matter of colorism. And this is how did contemporary scholars handle 21st century dolls still modeled, arguably modeled on mammies and other quote folk images where the individual has black rather than brown skin tones? 
Say that again. How sure. do? Sure. How do contemporary scholars handle 21st century dolls, arguably modeled on mammies and other folk, oh. folk images, where the individual has black rather than brown skin tones? This is not colorism necessarily, but it's speaking to the matter of color. Well, one of the things I found striking about the exhibit is that when you see all these dolls all together, you, you see how many of them are very dark. And we know African Americans come in all shades. And, and throughout the period that we're talking about, they came in all shades. That might not have been true in 1650, <clears throat> but it certainly was true during the periods these dolls are made, and it's certainly true today. So why is it then that these dolls, for the most part, there are two or three uh, somewhat lighter dolls in the, in the section before the 20th century, before you get to contemporary dolls, um, that, have, that are sort of brown rather than this very, very dark, either actually black material or very, very dark brown material. Only some black people look that way, not all of them, but yes, the majority of these dolls look that way. And to me, that speaks to, uh, to some degree, uh, the um, visual stereotypes. Mm -hmm. uh, because it, if you get a person, if you have a doll that is um, a more a lighter in tone, mm -hmm. then you get to the problem that Angela was talking about, about, about passing. Who, who what, what, does, what does that uh, represent? Um, you know, if we can't tell whether whether the doll is black or white, these dolls live, make it completely unambiguous that you were talking about a black person. And it reminds me of the fact um, that in the early 20th century, uh, in a lot of movies, African Americans who actually had relatively light skin themselves had to black up in order to be dark enough to be in these films to satisfy the desires of the producers and the directors to have a, um, a unmistakably dark black person, even, even um, oh gosh, now I'm forgetting his name, the famous um, minstrel who's on, who's on um, uh, Broadway. Uh, Williams. Yes. He is a light-skinned, I think, Bahamian. He was certainly from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. He was a light-skinned man from the Caribbean who blacks up because from the stage, if you're an audience, you couldn't tell whether he was black or not if he didn't have this on. And that points to the power um, of, these, of, of this contrast. You can see it in various forms of art as well. How many images of impressionists are made of you know, the white woman who is being served by the dark black servant, usually a woman, but sometimes if they're doing Orientalism, it might be a eunuch or you know a man who's a eunuch, but this contrast between white and black, I think, was very powerful in the um, 1700s and the 1800s, and lasts in complex ways into the 1900s and even today. Mm -hmm. You touched on it all. <laughs> <laughs> well. The one thing I will say, just to close out, we don't have an uh, opportunity to actually ask a question, but one of the questions is about uh, Leo Moss, the um, handyman from Georgia who repurposed white dolls. And one thing that I would say um, about those dolls that's really powerful, it's a real highlight of the exhibition to look at them and to look at mm -hmm. the cross sections, the x-rays of them to sort of get an mm -hmm. idea of his, 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 his handiwork, but also the way that the expressions um, the, the, the tears going down, how his dolls really humanize black children and black people in incredibly powerful ways. So I'm glad that somebody asked a question about Leo Moss and um, I apologize. I, his dolls were ones that I wondered whether children actually played with them. Exactly. Because they, they are so, they, they, they express some of the pain of African-Americans in, in a very um, a direct way. And then the fact that they have some kind of voice box possibly in them and we can't, we don't know what they said or what their, you know, what that, the sounds that the voice box was making um, to me is just, um, uh, is so evocative. Um, and it's something that you actually rarely see in Dolls for Children is that level of, of pain because 
often people don't want to expose that to children. Although, as we know, enslaved children were exposed to this in real life all the time. Well, an extraordinary show, clearly, uh, an extraordinary speakers, wonderful colleagues. I do want to shout out to my uh, curatorial friends, Margie Hofer and Dominique Jean-Louis, who've done a beautiful job for this That's exhibition. That's a great exhibition. Very thoughtful, <laughs> concise, but very thoughtful. Yeah. <laughs> but we've unfortunately run out of time. So I do want to thank Faith Davis Ruffins, Angela Tate, and Michelle Mitchell for being with us today and for this brilliant discussion. Um, for the rest of you, please sign up for our mailing list and follow us at nyhistory.org to get the latest on upcoming salons like this one. Uh, and finally, New York Historical Society is currently open on Wednesday through Sunday. You can reserve your time to entry museum tickets on our website. We do hope to see you on Central Park West to view the Black Dolls exhibition in the flesh. Clearly, this is something worth your time. You must, must see. And Title IX, Activism on and Off the Field, uh, show opening May 13th in our Joyce D. Cowan Women's History Gallery. Thank you all again, and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.